an MS student at the uh, music technology program. And uh, I love symmetry. Um, and then I also like to break it, but uh, not really, but explore the spaces between um, the interaction with the symmetry space and uh, your interaction with the music. All right, so the architecture of this little experiment is basically I have um, Ableton Live running, and I'm using Max for Live. And up here, where you see that's a Cayley graph, and it's essentially the symmetric group of order four. Um, and uh, basically, it's uh, the permutations connected by different transformations. And uh, my uh, thinking is you can explore this set in real time, especially when you have like an iPad interface. And uh, this is the new Mirror app. So this is interfacing with Max. Uh, so I can press something on here, and you'll see it light up over there. So that means I just selected one, two, three, four. And I will call that the normal form. OK, so right now we're just concentrating on the blue graph right now. Uh, what's happening is I'm sending information from here and is choosing uh, a particular permutation and is sending that to Haskell which is running in a process over OSC it's sending it and then Haskell does some uh, mutation and then it sends that to Max for live and if you see at the bottom where the notes are right now it's like a staircase pattern um, essentially like that's a drum loop that's cut up and it's like a rex file uh, instead of having to remix it by hand I can use the permutation to quickly try different mathematical combinations. So right now, that's one, two, three, four, and then that's like a tetrachord, so then four steps. So that I'm using that kind of pattern throughout this whole presentation. So uh, I'm going to follow the arrows on the first Cayley diagram. Let's go back to the normal form just for one second. So that's one beat. Now think of the opposite of that beat. It's kind of a more offbeat pattern. So that's still with the same permutation, but I just changed the, uh, the actual beat that was the originator of that pattern. So now I'm going to bring in a bass line, which is triggered from the same pattern, but through a scale mapping. So everything's being triggered from the same permutation. If you look at, uh, if you have any of you are familiar with live, you can see this um, scale mapper. So basically, that's what the baseline uh, is being mapped. So instead of going like 
up a scale, it's just kind of crazy till it sounds good. What I usually do is I get that working for the normal form till it sounds really groovy. And then so uh, with that idea, maybe the rest of the permutations will kind of sound similar. I mean, to a sound uh, to the same sort of transformation as a drum beat's going, but kind of in counterpoint. Okay, so I've been doing this for a while and I'm thinking, you know, I like this, but um, it's, it kind of like doesn't really go anywhere. Even though you're traveling around, it's very kind of two-dimensional. Um, and there is, you know, I've noticed that with music, it's the very, of course, the subtleties that really matter. So if you're playing a pattern and uh, the next time you play the pattern, it might be like one note at the end is muted or something. And then you go back to the original one. You can kind of play that same sort of pattern for a while as opposed to listening to the same thing um, just looping. So uh, I was thinking of a way to do that using permutations because um, I'm really interested to hear how the math would sound. Uh, so basically what I did was I um, took two permutations. Like So now we're going to go to the green graph here. And basically what happens is you press one button and then the next button you press after that is going to be the target. And then Haskell will compute all the in-between permutations by transpositions of two elements at a time. OK, and then, uh, so that was really kind of tricky to do. But when I finally figured it out, it was amazing, because you had to like use like inverse transformations and everything. And uh, this is what I love uh, Haskell using this stuff for, because it's, uh, it's really great for um, combining your ideas and then getting like one Cartesian product of all your ideas and then exploring that. You know, so um, you can't, it can't beat that. So basically what I'm doing is I'm using a Cartesian product of orbits um, for permutations, uh, transpositions moving uh, one element at a time. Okay, so here we go with this again. We're going to listen to uh, the new graph here. The same graph, but the new mapping, the new process. So basically, I hit it twice. And so now it's going to... The next one I hit is going to go mapping from the normal form right there to the next one. See, now those are all the in-between permutations. Now when I go to the next one, it's going to go from the one you just hit to the next one. Now it takes a second for this to compute because of uh, the Max for Live interface. I'm still working on speeding that up. Let's see. This is how I like to mix, too. Very, very quiet, so. <laughs> That's even more, okay, sure. In that case, I have to slow it down, too. So um, I purposely, sometimes if I play live, I'll have, all, of course, more controls. And uh, I purposely didn't use that here because I wanted to really focus on the way the music's changing. That still sounds kind of boring to me, but at least right there, we have some sort of germ of a pattern which we can, you know, uh, progress from. So m my goal is to find different ways of interacting with these different mathematical objects. And of course, it's, uh, it's the way you map it, of course, to the music. Um, that's everything. But once you decide on one mapping, then you have the rest of the mathematical space to, to work through. Because, um, because if you keep everything else the same, then, of course, uh, you can listen to the way that changes as you move around the space. 
I'm um, also exploring the uh, platonic solids in 3D. And um, that, when I'm working towards that, is uh, using the coordinates of the vertexes to uh, decide parameters for digital synthesis. Um, but right now, uh, this one is just note-based, and I'm noticing, too, that uh, even the notes is very long, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to make it more micro, and I'm trying to work more down towards the DSP level, and then kind of maybe even work back up from that. Uh, is there any questions from anyone? Yes? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, yes, uh, the question is, um, for a programmer to work with this, uh, is it available and is it easy to use as a programmer without being a musician? Um, that's kind of like uh, another goal that I'm, I'm shooting towards just because of um, I want to hear things that I, I don't think of, you know, and I want to be able to have a way to use your intuition, no matter whether you're a musician or not, uh, to explore these spaces. And I'm putting a lot of faith in the fact that these are symmetrical spaces and, you know, they're, they're used for many amazing things in math that I really don't understand. But, <laughs> but working with this, um, it's great because, because you can, um, play around with it and feel like if you say, okay, well, I'm over in this side of the space. Now I know if I go over to the other corner, it's going to kind of do this thing. I don't know what it means, but it kind of sounds a certain way. So once you get a feel for it, um, I like to think of it as like a flow. So, I mean, if you're flowing with it and you're, j you're jiving with it, so then you're going to keep exploring it. Um, and the key is, I think, is in the mapping. So um, uh, when this will be available, um, the thing would be to do is to have different mappings. Um, and I'm still... See, right now I'm exploring. I'm using um, Max for Live as uh, kind of as the um, the the uh, scheduler and stuff because um, instead of con uh, coding it all myself, you know, it's a really quick way to experiment with this. But if I was to make this available live, then I would have to um, code it all into maybe use like libpd or something, put it in an iPhone app or something, be uh, real simple, and then build up from there. Like uh, maybe you can order new objects and stuff and um, so if it was a, if it was a programmer's tool, then I would like to have a way for the programmer to actually define their own spaces. So then we're talking about language. And these ideas have been flying around my head for a long time, so there's many different ways to go with it. But I really do feel like it's gonna move in a certain direction where I'd like to, you know, present this to other people and have them see what they can do with it. Uh, yes? Yes, that's kind of why I'm, I'm choosing functional programming and specifically Haskell because, oh, the question is, thank you. The question is, uh, can you use higher level abstractions um, with exploring the space? And uh, see, that's the next goal because as you're interacting, okay, so, okay, now I have this space. I mean, I, I work with it, got a certain flow. Now what happens? You know, is that it? Or do I just change to something totally different, do something totally different? What can we do? So. What I'm doing uh, for my master's project at Georgia Tech is uh, trying to incorporate some sort of um, machine learning, maybe um, inductive logic programming. I'm not sure if that's the right way to go yet, but uh, a way to for the system to monitor your choices. And possibly it can tell if you like something by the amount of times you go back to it or the amount of times you let it play. So um, that's very interesting. And I think that's the next way to go because what I would like to do is actually have like a grammar explore the space for you or have an evolutionary process explore this space, you know. Um, of course, getting information from your real-time input, too. So there's many different ways to go. But when you're interacting with it, there's many levels of interaction. And it always changes depending on what you're using. So um, that's kind of like the next step, I'm thinking. Uh, yeah, anyone else? Yes. Uh, not yet. No, this is, I actually, that's a good question. I actually haven't played out with this particular system. Oh, the, the question is, thank you. The question is, have you, can you make people dance with this or, or have I already made people dance with this? And the answer is I haven't used it yet in that kind of situation. Um, I use a similar situation, uh, evolutionary programming to generate 
just kind of, you know, evolve stuff. And it's almost like even random because I got some fitness functions, but who knows what's going on at any time because I'm just pressing buttons. Stuff sounds good. And if it, I mean, you get like a, a phrase, but I can tweak it with a knob and just put it like two octaves higher in a scale map. So if I put it like two octaves in one step, it's still going to be in the right scale, but it's going to shift the way it conforms to the tonality. So, um, you know, basically, I have these set of controls, and I use the evolutionary uh, system to explore these spaces. And uh, there's a, um, just something online. I did a, a, about a 45-minute set at the Georgia Tech Tech Arts Festival last year. It's online. Um, and I, I, what I'm, I was thinking about doing is uh, posting um, some more follow-up to this on, on the uh, Haskell Arts um, mailing list. So when, if I do that, then I'll put all the information, the relevant information for that. Um, anyone else? Or? Thank you very much. I'm muted, so I